to start uh, the uh, you know, that's a sort of group. sign up. And um, I guess we had a lot of people out there. It's kind of weird. Hmm. All right. Well, then um, what we'll do is we'll take we'll do we'll cover whatever presentations we have today. Um, the more the merrier. I do not have a, le a lecture plan for today. I was assuming we'd be attending to the presentations. <clears throat> so today we'll do presentations. Next week, um, whatever we don't finish with today, we'll finish with next week. Um, I do have a lecture prepared for next week and a debriefing next week, which is kind of separate from the lecture. It's, it's kind of my way of signing off, if you will. Um, also, next week, I'm going to... Um, uh, be bringing in the uh, student evaluation, uh, or your evaluation that you fill out. Um, I've been told I need to designate a student that I'll then hand them off to, and they'll return them, I guess, to the office. I suppose, I presume everyone is, is familiar with that, so if someone wants to volunteer for that, um, all right, I appreciate that. And so what I was going to do is, so next week we'll do, if we have additional uh, presentations, we'll finish those up. Um, I'll do my lecture. And then I'll do my debriefing, and I'll leave. And I'll leave you guys to do the evaluations, and then hand them to Tam when you're done. We're out of here. Okay? All right. Um, I am collecting the FPGA kits. I've got six of them. Uh, I should be picking up ten. While we're collecting those, um, I brought this for you. I'll go over this with you because there's some things I want you to know about it in case wires, if I put wire nuts on, I've got it configured, so all you do is pull it, in, plug it in, and it'll already spin in a direction. Cool. So, if, I mean, if there's, there's not much more to it than that. I don't know what you can do with it. Just be careful. Uh, but I want to tell you, I want to tell you a little bit more about it, the color combinations. Will these come off or, or by accident? Yeah. These are the color combinations you want to collect, red and gray, and white and blue. Right. As long as you keep them paired in those orders, it doesn't matter how, if you switch them or not. But, but don't put the red and gray together. The red and the gray are separate, and the white and the blue are separate. You can go, you can go anywhere you want. Just whatever way you go, it'll turn in one direction. If you flip them, switch them, it'll go the other direction. All right. So just plug it in, and you know, just be careful. These don't come off. If they do, put them back on. Just, cool. you know, you know how to, just the yeah. wire. Here. Just clip this on the yeah. on the wire. Thank you so much. All right. And, and what I would do, based on what you told me, you might want to get an old bottle you found in the trash and stick this in the bottle. Yeah. Good and idea. then let it, let it sit on the bottom and plug this in. Just be careful that as it's turning, it doesn't grab the cable and, and pull on the right. Okay? And when you're done with that, if you could take it to the office, Dr. Uh, Walston's office, oh, yes, sir. and put it, let someone in there know it's for me. I don't know if it will fit in my mailbox, but if it does, <laughs> put it in my mailbox. If not, I'll just pick it up next week. But if you're, you know, don't, if you want to wait till next Tuesday and bring it, that's fine, too. I don't care. You just do what you want to do. Just, I don't want to lose it, is the real thing. So don't, don't like to leave it hanging around. Okay, um, so uh, if we're not going to, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and start the projects. I'm going to take a seat back here, and I'll be making notes. Um, I encourage the class, when you come up, give us a little bit of introduction. Um, you decide when you make your presentation whether you prefer questions asked during, the, like, during your presentation, if you'd rather we hold the questions until the end. It's up to you. I want you to own it. This is a table. I hope this is adequate. If you need power, does anyone need power? Okay. Um, oh, I knew I forgot something. I forgot my, uh, How far is the socket from the overhead? The ease is one. Oh. oh, okay. Yeah, okay. that's true. If not, I have this. Yeah, yeah, we're good. You can actually use this as work. Got a fabric to last for a while. So plug that. Good deal. There we go. Okay. So there's your power. Um, and I think we can go ahead and start. Tom, you want to go first? Um, can I get some materials just to set up everything? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Up there? Yeah. Of course. Tam, do you have a question? Oh, I not. Okay. Just gonna take you need a hand around? No, I'm good. All right. Well, actually, I have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm just going to oh. explore the demo. Sure. Thank you. Cycle through for you? Um, uh, I, can, I can do that. I'm going to be up here. Okay. Raspberries, or the one raspberry now. Mm -hmm. 
Shai AOC, and I am present. I am showcasing my web application for a final engineering project here today that was built on the Linux Raspberry Pi. And uh, it's a relatively bare bones computer. I'll go more into detail with it as I um, move throughout the presentation. But um, primarily, this is going to be a uh, showcase of um, a web application that was built using this platform, built on this computer, and uh, essentially everything else uh, that I have up here right with me right now. So without further ado, I will continue this presentation. So you hear me throw this term around a lot, and several of you have probably seen me walk around campus with that box, um, wondering what's inside of it. And this is a Raspberry Pi. Um, in order to just kind of keep everyone up to speed here, um, the Raspberry Pi itself is a relatively simplistic micro microcomputer. Uh, it's very recreational. Um, it has many it has a very wide range of usages, and technically it comes in four models. We have Pi 1, 2, 3, and then 0. Don't ask me why it goes in that order, it just does. This is a Pi 2, it's a Model 2 Mark B, and essentially this little green motherboard here is what I'll be using. Um, and all the wire sticking out of it is used to power the touchscreen here. This is the or this is the VGA cable which is programmed to output visual, well essentially visual data. This is the power supply. And there's a half a key back here for touch input. Um, so yeah, that was working out to speed. Um, Raspbian is a relatively light, it's a very bit crushed, uh, if we can call it that, um, version of an operating system. It's partially based off of Linux Mint. It is small enough to where it can fit on a relatively very small microcomputer like this one, but it is very it's relatively large enough where it can it can do several computational based tasks simultaneously like web browsing and data logging and what have you. So that is the micro, or that is the uh, micro operating system we'll be using. And, uh, I've come to love it a lot, but regarding, um, I used the term at the beginning of the presentation called web app. Um, this is partially what I was developing with this thing over the course of several weeks. A web app is essentially a web-based application. It's exactly what it sounds like it is. Um, it is a software application that is based off of an online database and can be accessed from anywhere in the world as long as you have an internet connection. It's configurable by the admin and is essentially easy to access and can be used by anyone anytime. Um, so that is partially what a web application is. Um, if I'm going too fast for you guys, by the way, and I lose anyone, please let me know because I have a tendency to do that. So shortly I'll be showing you the web app itself, but for now, continue on with some of the geography-based terms. Um, the web app that I've configured itself on this thing is uh, primarily geography-based. So before moving on, I'll update you with some geography-oriented terms. GIS is short for Geographic Information System, if you've never heard of that, and I don't blame you if you haven't. It's very obscure. Um, it's essentially what you see with Google Maps, Yahoo Maps, or MapQuest, um, anything else in between that's used with uh, global positioning. It is a very large scale database that's full of 3D topographical data that's used in traffic, or excuse me, in tracking maps. And uh, essentially it's what you see um, in MapQuest. Uh, whatever you might have on your phone, there is GIS data on that device itself. So ArcGIS, on the other hand, is a very different kind of GIS. It's a software application developed by a corporation known as Esri. And, uh, it was the pivotal software that was used to actually configure the app itself. Um, I used several tutorials on ArcGIS. Um, it's available online for free, and that's part of what I was using. And then Esri, as I just mentioned, they're short for the Environmental Systems Research Institute based out of California, and they have primarily been the private corporation that has programmed ArcGIS, along with several other map-based, GIS-based applications like ArcMap, ArcPad, and then ArcInfo. You can always tell it's them because it has the word arc in front of it all the time. So, and before continuing on, I would like to, one second. I want to be able to, a few of you are probably wondering, what is the difference between something like this and something like an FPGA? Well, they might look similar upon first glance, but they are very different in their practical applications. And FPGAs, uh, the gate arrays, those are almost always used for some large-scale projects, such as industrial networking, aerospace, and uh, defense engineering. They're used in medical systems like CT scanners, um, computerized tomography. 
all sorts of very high scale stuff. And then Raspberry Pis are more or less recreational usage for hardware projects, anything that's based off of uh, a physical project more or less. You also have other open source programming applications. It, it can depend, really. There, I like to think of both of them as very specialized uh, microcomputers. One of them is much more uh, higher grade and is used for a very large scale purpose. And then one of them is just kind of vague and is more or less recreational. You can do whatever you want with it. So, moving on to the project outline, the goal itself, I wanted to create an informative GIS based web application that can be accessed from a bare bones style Linux machine like this. So um, this should blend, once again, haptic feedback with uh, pleasant visuals and just accurate data in general to make a very refined web application in a sense that can be used by anyone whatsoever. The process itself was relatively lengthy. The application was partly developed on all sorts of operating systems, be it, albeit Windows, OS X, and then Raspbian, which is a Linux based operating system. Um, I wanted to ensure that it could operate across multiple platforms. So I made sure to develop it across uh, well, multiple operating systems. And uh, this was essentially the process that it took. And if possible, I would, if you guys would be all right, and if you have any feedback for me, I would love to make it publicly accessible uh, for anyone online. And essentially, moving on, I've talked about the web app, and I've talked about the device that was built on it but I have been very vague with what kind of application it is. And essentially, I wanted to mix computer science with a practical application in marine biology and put together a sort of data-driven metric that dealt with, um, I'm sure you guys have heard of manatees. And essentially, um, this application tracks the patterns, the dietary, my, the dietary patterns, the, mig the migratory patterns, and uh, the population displayed population growth of the West Indian manatee, also known as Trichecus manatus, in the binomial nomenclature. So what I'm going to do is I am going to list the application features while I attempt to boot up the app on the Pi Pad here. So the application itself, it features a story-based layout user interface and display, so that way anyone, even your grandparents, are relatively familiar with the UI. They don't have to, you don't have to have any sort of great, incredible technical background in, uh, in computer science in order to use it. It's relatively straightforward. It can uh, be accessed anywhere, and once again, across all platforms. The geographic data collected is from the Florida Natural Areas Inventory, the FNAI, if you will, and the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, FWS. Uh, this data is straight from Tallahassee. It's followed by the local and federal government. I wanted to make sure that it was all legitimate, so uh, most of this is going to be found on uh, their ArcGIS pages, or otherwise the, excuse me, it can also be accessed just via, via government websites in general. Um, there's some customized heat mapping that I included with this. There's pictures, there's pop-ups. Um, there are other things to continuously grasp the user attention. Um, I want to make sure that no one would get bored with this right away. Um, so there are some visuals, there's enough pop-ups, there's some information. It's kind of like, an, I like to think of the application as a sort of, uh, when you go to the aquarium and you have this screen in front of you that displays information about the species in the cage in front of you. It's sort of like one of those terminals. Um, but that's, that's it very watered down. So um, essentially, I don't want to lose the user's attention. I gave it some graphics. And we also have facts and additional information that is gathered from the FNAI and Fish and Wildlife Service ultimately the IUCN field work as well, just so that way we can continue to have a legitimate, uh, can have legitimate data by the end. So, without further ado, I will be switching to the overhead here and displaying the application. If I can get this loaded, very slowly it takes a little time. Well, this is the primary page. Oh, wow, that's right. Here, we have to zoom out a little yep. bit. Yep, yep. Oh, right there. Can you guys see the screen or is it too bright?
Oh, okay. Well, there we go. That's better. Yeah, just kind of like. That's perfect. That will do. You guys can see that, right? Okay, so I won't. Will turn these lights off? The overhead lights? Um, let's do that. Yeah, please. So this is the primary web page where the application is based. Uh, you can see a thumbnail. You can see some information. This has been compiled. Um, most recently, I was working on this yesterday, so it's like May eighth. If we scroll down a bit more, we can see some more information. We get to the size of it. It's very bite-sized. It's 243 kilos. Um, that's what I like about it most of all. And if you look at the views, um, it's not publicly accessible, but it's been accessed by a few folks with, um, within the ArcGIS and Esri community. It's been viewed, at this point, over 1,000 times. And uh, I was really impressed with that. I didn't know how to do it. I was able to um, share this with a few folks, and I guess it got passed around. But I want to raise awareness for the West Indian Manatee and also Linux-based software, but I'll get into that later. If how many times was it viewed? 1,070. You guys can see this, right? Yep. Excellent. So this is the application. This is the initial um, page that you'll be faced with when you access it. Um, I actually included a little new college embed link here. If you click on the blue icon, it'll take you to the environmental science program associated with New College of Florida. Um, that was just something I was probably, it was sort of like a eureka moment. Probably uh, less profound than, it, than I think it is, but I like that a lot. So I embedded that in there. You can see an overhead map of Florida. If we scroll down, right here, this interactive web-based GIS application is meant to inform viewers of the migratory, dietary, and patterns oftentimes associated with the West Indian Florida manatee. And then I have some personal information here. We can keep scrolling. There's a picture of a manatee there. This one was captured by Kings Bay, which is up by Crystal River. It's one of my personal favorite pictures. Uh, if we keep scrolling, we'll see an introduction. Oh, wow. So here we can see a heat map that is directly proportionate to the population count of manatees in the area. Um, once again, if we have a little legend right here that you can see, it gives all the data that you might need. Um, what's a map about a legend, essentially? And again, this is uh, it's heat based, so you can see population density by a particular area of Florida. And they're almost all based out of Florida. So here you can see some introductory information. The West Indian manatee is a vulnerable marine mammal. Or in coastal waters of the Caribbean Sea. Um, the Florida manatee is a subspecies of the West Indian manatee itself. And if we keep scrolling, you can see another little infographic here. This is the size in comparison to a fully grown human. They can grow up to 10 feet, which is absolutely ridiculous. And um, essentially, if we scroll here, we can look at the little subtext. Most adult Florida manatees grow to an average of 10 feet in length. So this is what I've got for that part. If we keep scrolling, we'll be able to take more information from their habitat. This is information collected by Crystal River. You can see a sort of heat map. They all gather around these power plants. But Florida manatees, they do prefer warm and shallow waters, um, anywhere from a range upwards of 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I believe, what is that, to 20 something degrees Celsius. I would need to do the math on that. Um, salinity levels generally don't affect them. They can, they're both freshwater and saltwater creatures. They can live in both environments for a limited period of time. They do prefer fresh water, technically. And um, because of their preference for warmer waters, um, they will commonly congregate near human power plants, which is what you see right here. This is the map itself. Um, right in this general area where this all this activity is, that's the Crystal River Nuclear Power Facility, where um, it's one of the biggest power plants, or nuclear power plants in the United States itself. So the warm um, byproduct that is produced by the nuclear fission heats the water, and oftentimes, attracts manatees to it, so they have a home, they have a place where they can meet up year-round, especially in the winter time, and uh, well, humans gain a sort of, a very alternative-based energy from it, without uh, all the harmful byproducts of nuclear energy for the manatees. They just get the heat, and they oftentimes navigate the area. So if we keep scrolling down, we can see Gulf Coast water temperatures as of January 1st. This was collected, if you can actually tap the image, There it is. If you can tap the image, we can get an, another infographic of uh, water temperatures. 
it evened out to about 24.83 degrees Celsius um, last year, which is anywhere between, I believe, 76 and 77 degrees Fahrenheit in total coastal water temperature, which is perfect for a manatee. Again, they can't go any lower than 68 degrees. Um, if they do, their metabolic rates will begin to kind of falter, and um, well, they'll, they'll begin to die, and uh, we don't want that. So there's the infographic. Um, we have a little pop-up here. This was from an article where 300 manatees at once decided to swamp the power plant because of a congregation. It was, there were 300 at one time, and it was the most adorable inconvenience you ever did see. <laughs> <laughs> um, there were several. So we had, we had that. But that was a couple of years ago. Did Which power plant was that? That was at Crystal River. Okay. Um, let me update this. Sometimes this layer gives me some issues. Oh, there we go. Okay. Takes a bit to load. So if we keep scrolling down here, That's the last, that is the last piece of the application, but we don't want to go there just yet. Okay, here we go. This is the diet of the manatee. This is the little subsection that deals with their dietary patterns. Um, as you can see here, this has been data collected by the Fish and Wildlife Service. It is mapping the amount of seagrass, both freshwater and saltwater, that is located throughout the state of Florida and density. The shade of green is directly proportionate to the density of the seagrass itself. So if you look here, you can see the Everglades are extremely high density. Um, they have the highest shade of green to them for several miles. Um, essentially because, um, if you scroll down here, you can see that Florida manatees, just like every other single manatee in the order Tyrrhenia, it is very, it's, pr it's primarily, or it's primarily or they're herbivores, essentially. Um, occasionally they'll eat fish, but it's very rare. So. The more seagrass that you'll have to a particular area, the more likely that you'll be to see a manatee in general. Um, that can depend based on the water temperature. It's very determinant on quite a few factors. But um, it, it's adorable because they use their whiskers. They're very long sort of dog whiskers to s sniff out and detect food. Um, they don't have the best eyesight. So oftentimes, if you see one at the aquarium, that's why it's bonking up against the glass like that because they can't see it. Most of the time, they'll just use their whiskers to detect food. And more often than not, per day, they'll eat 10 to 15 percent of their own body weight in seagrass, which is anywhere from 100 to 300 pounds a day in seagrass, which I actually found was really amazing. I did not know that. Um, that's a lot of seagrass in general. And once again, we have all of the data was collected from the Florida Natural Areas Inventory and the Fish and Wildlife Service up in Tallahassee. I like that, but we have that going. Here's another legend, let me minimize that. So our final little slide here, this is a zoom in on Apollo Beach, which if many of you know, is directly north of here. Um, behaviors of the sea cow, they're, they're very, very friendly. They're very gentle for, mo for the most part. Um, most of the time, they've garnered a positive reputation. Uh, they become Florida's official state marine mammal. And here, zoom around this area here, and you can see population density by the size of the manatee itself. So you'll have several hundreds of these at once, um, absolutely just swarming if I zoom in. This is the PICO primary flagship power plant that powers all of Tampa, essentially. And um, in Apollo Beach, you'll have several of them at once. So there's a very large concentration here in woods by the power plant. You can also see that there's a few that are also on the outskirts as well. They'll gather there for the warm water. And uh, for any of you guys, fun fact, this road right here, that's US 41. So if you were to go out on 41 right there, just keep going north, you'll hit this. You'll hit the power plant itself. And um, I don't know. I've, I've been there myself, and there are very, very many manatees at once in the water. I just thought it was fascinating. So you can see here's another legend that deals with size um, relative to population density. So there are upwards of 400, 500 that were recorded here in 2016, which is quite a few. And then if we scroll down, um, you can see more information about their temperament, the fact that they're very docile creatures for the most part, 
But they are very slow moving, and because of that friendly demeanor and everything else in between, they are vulnerable to boats and um, ocean crafts that are moving faster than 15 miles per hour, which is unfortunate because that's part of what put them on to be vulnerable with. And if you click here, we can see a picture of a diver with a manatee. So, So in conclusion, and um, through my results, um, if there's anything any of you learned from this today, I would just really hope that the West, the manatees themselves, manatees are very, they're adorable creatures, and if you see them in public, you should probably admire them from a distance. But um, they were recently taken off the IUCN critically endangered list and moved to vulnerable. But this means that they are still very vulnerable. So if you do see them, admire them from a distance. Uh, don't get too close, because you never know, but they are still very vulnerable creatures. Um, I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that this app can raise awareness for threatened marine life, such as the West Indian manatee and other orders under the subclass of Cyrenia. Um, it's always been a sort of passion for me. The picture down at the bottom left-hand corner is actually uh, Hugh, the most intelligent manatee ever in Alpine Moat Marine. I took a trip out there, and he kept ramming the glass. Like, you can't make this up. He's the smartest manatee in the world. And he just would not stop smushing his nose. But um, <laughs> after that, I mean, after um, I like this to, to garner some kind of attention uh, for the West Indian, Indian manatee. They're great creatures, and if also possible, I'd love to raise some awareness for uh, Linux-based open source pr and proprietary uh, software and hardware, such as the Raspberry Pi and other uh, Linux-based softwares, such as Linux Mint. If you guys want a really cool operating system experience um, that I use to sort of build up this application, you can go to linuxmint.org and they have the basic, the basic uh, vanilla kind of uh, Linux operating system. And from there you can sort of modify it to make it yours. It's very customizable. It's my favorite operating system by far. And uh, it's what I use on this guy over here. So I'd like to thank, um, in conjunction with this, um, we have adjunct professor Aubrey Phillips, who's here uh, in the Environmental Science Department, who gave a tutorial for GIS and uh, WebGIS application development. I learned quite a bit from that class. And I'd also like to thank my uh, academic advisor, Matt Lipinski, for his vast knowledge of the Linux command line. I could not have gone anywhere without his help and um, his suggestions for some good reading here and there. So once again, I have no idea how it happened, but it's been gotten over a thousand views, and if, that's, if that raises awareness for the manatees, then I couldn't be happier. I think it's fantastic. And um, if you guys have any thoughts or suggestions or you want to see anything put into the application that you just saw that I might be missing or that you might want to see in it, then you can feel free to contact me at that email right there. I'll take into consideration if you want to ask a question or just offer any sort of advice. I'd be more than happy to consider it. Um, but that's essentially what I've got here today. I will finish up with that. Um, I hope you all learned something, and well, thanks so much for listening. Great. Good job, Tom. Any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Okay. I have questions. <laughs> oh, well, I have lots of questions, but I'm only going to ask a few. That was awesome. So, um, so let me find the most, let me find the uh, best ones here. So there's a bunch of stuff I'm interested in. Number one, I, I have to give you all the credit because you've, you've put together quite a hybrid of, um, uh, of topics here. You've got a technical issue, technology issue, you've got a hardware issue, the Raspberry Pi, you've got a software issue, uh, presuming you know all, all much or not all the programming. Um, the manatee is an interesting, very interesting um, animal. Now, what I'm curious though is, um, I, I see you've done a hybrid of a collection of topics here. Geography, geographic data, um, background information, historical information, migrating, maybe even migration paths. Which of these topics did you spend the most time on and you feel the most knowledgeable about? I'd say the programming, without question. Just getting any kind of information or any sort of knowledgeable. Just learning about Linux in general has been a fascinating process. And while I really enjoyed learning about the manatees and everything that they have to offer um, regarding the state and all their data, I've learned more about Linux than I probably ever will again uh, doing this, just because I have had 
very little information or very little experience with Linux-based operating systems. Um, I've learned more about programming in the Linux command line. I've uh, learned about the help community of Raspberry Pi. It's, it's all very helpful, but I would say it's definitely be computational. Awesome. Aspect. Awesome. And you know what they say, when you become an expert in something, then you become a teacher as well. Um, I'm, I'm also interested, in fact, you just made me think of something. So you, you've, you've learned, you've become, you've mastered the Raspberry Pi, obviously. You run, I guess you're probably in Python, is that what you're doing? No, Python, yeah. Python. And I don't know if, you, if all of you can appreciate or notice what he did here. He basically created the entire interface. That's a user interface. It's a graph, it's a, it's a, that screen is connected to the Pi, so the Pi is doing all the processing. I noticed some latency issues that may, may have been because of that. I don't know. It's a, yeah, it's a very, um, again, it's a bare bones based system. The actual computer is based off here. The right. wiring runs down to the driver, which gives power to the touch screen. This is the haptic feedback ribbon. And then this is the VGA cable, which I had to program um, to actually output the VGA instead of HDMI, okay. which, was which was a process. So here's some, here's some ideas and some things I just thought of. Now, so I'm seeing, I'm seeing what you've done here. You've already, you've already declared that you're area of expertise is the Raspberry Pi, which is awesome. But before this project, did you know anything about manatees? Very little. Okay. I had seen them, um, but I'm from Philly originally, so okay. when I first came down okay. here and I went to Moat Marine, um, that was when I decided, hey, I should do, make this application about manatees. Excellent, excellent. And I like that. Here's why. You, what you've done is you've got a business model here. I don't think you realize that. You've drawn in yourself and now us to manatees right. because of the Raspberry Pi. Now, you could take this same platform, I think, and apply it to any one of a number of different species, I'm uh, guessing. Well, absolutely. With the same sort of issues. I mean, this is, this is phenomenal. So what you've done is you've created an incentive for learning the Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. if nothing else. And I know there's thousands and thousands of applications. This is a real application. I love what you did here. You've collected information. You've, gone, you've accessed databases. The only thing I can think of that would be even cool that you could have done, and you can still do, is create a manatee cam or something. A manatee cam. I mean, you know, I'll you certainly look into that. Just something, you know, you've got, you yeah. talk about, talk about raising awareness. What better way to raise awareness than to put us in there, in the water with the manatees, you know, with boats. I don't know if you've all have ever seen this. It's a horrible sight. I grew up in Florida. I've, I've swam with manatees many times. And the worst thing that you can see is the manatee who's, who's been run over by a boat or a propeller. Um, it's just a horrible, horrible thing to see. Um, I love, I love to think we can stop that somehow. Maybe we can, maybe we can't. The point is, You've got what I see here is a phenomenal nucleus of technologies that can help in these kind of situations. And um, I have a lot more questions, but I'm gonna, I don't want to sure. keep you. Um, but this is great. Um, this, is, this is awesome. I didn't realize it was, it was in this, this, uh, this much detail and this, uh, this deep. Any other questions? If anyone else has any suggestions, feel free to email me, but that's okay. what I got for you. Awesome. Me. All right, Tom, thanks again. Awesome. <laughs> All right, um, for those of you who came in uh, the last few minutes, I'm, I'm collecting the um, FPGAs. We don't have to do that right now. I've also got a sign-up sheet going around. And uh, who would like to go next? Anybody? Pam? Tell me how you want the lighting. If you want, uh, did you get your thumb drive? Huh? I did, yeah, it's right here. All right. Um, do you need anything, Pam? Anything um, up here? You want me to yeah, shut this off? Um, uh, yes, sir. Any more lighting? I'm going to bring this up. I'm just no more lighting. Like, yeah, lighting. And um, uh, you guys might want to move a little bit closer to see, like, closer to see this. So move to the front desk to have a better view. So, hello everyone. For those uh, who do not know me, my name is Pam, and for my personal uh, for my project of uh, introduction to engineer, I create a kind of like a stage um, that tells a story in which I will narrate, and this is the real story of um, of it's a little bit of a Vietnamese history. Uh, it's among what the naval battles that I uh, found the help and really admire. And I, in the process, I use Kidami to make all these 
um, to make all this pop up and even the movement that you guys will see here. And so um, I um, and I'm not really sure how I uh, how I will be like uh, explain about the two gummy uh, while telling the story. So, so what I'm doing is I will be uh, I'll only be acting as a storyteller. I'll tell you guys the story and then. Afterward, if you guys have any questions, whether about like the Vietnamese culture or about the Kia Gummy itself, I'll be very happy to answer. And without further ado, let us begin. This is the history of my people about battle that free Vietnam. In 111 BC, the Chinese successfully invaded Vietnam and first begin 1,000 years of slavery. Many have rise up against the oppression and many have fallen. In 931 AD, Yu Linh Nang successfully repelled the Southern Han army, army and claimed himself to be the region general. For a short while, Vietnam known peace. However, seven years later, Yun Linh Nghe was killed by a Han general in order to reclaim the land. For vengeance and for freedom, Ngo Win, Yun Linh Nghe's son-in-law, mobilized his army for one last thing. In fear of Ngo Win, the Chinese general requests for reinforcement and begin to make his move. Their plan was to use these massive ships to mobilize their army and overpower Ngo Win with simply brute force. Being a clever man, Ngo Win knows that his smaller fleet would have no chance against them, and so he devised a cunning plan. He ordered his men to cut the trees, iron the tips, and put them underneath the river, allow the ties to hide the cold. And so he waited for the day of the battle. On the day of the battle, the Han army approaches. The battle commences during the high tide. As the Han army moves in, Ngo Win orders a small fleet waiting, acting as bait, to lure the Han's army in. Slowly and steadily, the Han army hook in and they place themselves into the traps. As the water helps, as the tide ups and the water gave way, the spike beneath shot up, immobilized the Han ships, and so they're nothing but sitting down. One by one, Ngo Win's fleet board the ship and burned them all. Soon, at least half the Han's army sank. Desolated and defeated, they had no choice but to retreat. And thus, the battle was won. By driving away the Han, Ngo Win has successfully rescued Vietnam from its grasp and thus begin a new dawn for Vietnam. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. That was awesome. God, that was awesome. I didn't want it to stop. I, I would have paid for that. I'm just picturing this thing, you traveling around the world, giving this, just like you did, to, to, to audiences of all ages. I mean, that, is, that, was, that was awesome. Any questions? Any comments? Man, if the cup was hot like that. Yeah. Well, How much time did it take you to make this? Longer than, than I would want it to. I have to juggle this between thesis and back at the same time, so... Mm -hmm. oh. Wow. Um, so this this is this is the kirigami uh, that you were talking about. I, I had no idea you were thinking of it on this level. Um, wow, this is uh, this is really cool. Um, in fact, I want to talk to you later about this. This, this is I, I got some ideas that might. Um, I mean, of course, my brain. I'm thinking, how can you monetize this? And I think you could monetize this and make it so, have a, such an impact. Everything you just did, what drew me in, I think.
think it probably drew everybody in. I mean, everything. The, the topic, the history, the, the culture, the artwork, you know, everything you just did drew me in. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, you could, you could create the production out of this in any one of a number of ways. And I, I hope you don't stop here. I hope you keep thinking about how to build this and grow this because this is awesome. I mean, I would even I would have been, I would have even been as, as equally interested watching it on a video as I would have been you know in person. And so um, maybe you want to you can think of create a series of videos on this on this. And the fact that you went did you pick that particular period in time for a reason? No, it's well I picked that for a reason because it's like it's um, well when I back when I was like fifth grade and I learned about this particular battle I thought it's the coolest thing in the world and it just stuck with me ever since. Wow. Wow, I might hire you to come into my classes and make some presentations like this. Um, what, um, what, what was there a, was the, how big was this battle? Was there more to it or was this pretty much encompassing the overall events at that time? That's the um, overall, um, yeah, that's the uh, kind of like compensating all the overall um, event of it. If, um, Anything like if uh, there's nothing else that you guys learned today, like um, like at least appreciate, um, would hope that you guys would appreciate the uh, the genius of this general of Morwin in using like okay. the, in literally using nature as his ally and use um, like by hiding the pipe underneath the wave and just wait for the wave to the uh, to ebb and just use that moment to strike and that I think that's just the coolest thing. I'm a fan of. Um, like uh, historical strategy, so that's kind of just it. Yeah, it um, the thing just stuck with me ever since. So, there. I'm curious though. Th this is probably one of many kinds of battles like that. Yeah. But this one particular one drew you in. Were there specific elements of this one that were so much more interesting to you, or specific parts of it? The land, the geography, uh, the, the the cunningness of this, the cunning nature of his of his attack and ingenious methods. I would say, and, um, and, and, and those were those were mostly defensive methods, were they not? They, were they offensive? I didn't see any offensive. I mean, he was defending himself with these brilliant, ingenious. Right. Um, the point was simply to remove the Han fleet completely from Vietnam. Uh, so it's uh, purely defensive. And if you look at the historical aspect of it, um, in Vietnamese history, we um, like since the beginning of our time. We kind of established as nation, but then uh, the Chinese just kind of took over, and it, they basically enslaved for oh. a thousand years, um, oh more or less. And wow. so this battle puts the end to all that. Wow! And you, the, the music was—I yeah. love that music. It was so perfectly coupled with it. That was great. Good job, man. Awesome. Great. All right. All right. Okay. Who wants to go next? Kind of hard to follow up. That I know. It was, you, you want to take a break? I don't want to take a break. I, I, I would say that was these are these are both excellent, very very well deserved. Uh, um, gosh, projects. These were awesome, and I'm glad we got a. We're, we're we're actually streaming live right now, just for your information. And um, obviously, these are all all my videos are available. I converted them to MP4, and they're on YouTube, so you can get them from there, or you can call me and I'll send you a copy. Who, okay, who wants to go next? Anyone? Why do you want to? Uh, yeah, it's just a presentation, like a slide. That you okay. Can do you have a, a like a thumb drive? Just a site. Okay. Oh, oh, oh okay. Got it. So we'll give that a minute to warm up, and then we'll power this thing up. It looks like it's already powered up. Here we are. So You want to go from the uh, from the computer? Yeah. I right, warm it up. Give it a minute. It looks like it's still cooling down. Give it a minute. Sure. I always wonder what happens if you try to turn on these ones. Cool down the low threshold. Now I know. So as soon as that stops flashing, it'll come all by itself. Okay. Um, Back. Come around. I see the light.
Well, hello, my name is Ben Carruthers. Um, today I'm going to be presenting some work that's actually gone back about a year and a half. Um, but for this particular semester, I decided to iterate on um, a data logger, basically. So I've been working with data loggers through Mo Marine uh, primarily, and also with my thesis for about a year and a half, like I said. Um, run into problems, and I'm teaching a club, or at least I was teaching a club this past semester where we reached out to high school students around Sarasota County, and we wanted to build uh, data loggers, which I guess I should give a little bit of a, de a definition as to. It's some framework, some foundation on which you are looking at a parameter, whatever that is, we're surrounded by data pretty much everywhere, so it, and it's all pretty valuable. Um, you collect that data with some sensor or probe or whatever you have, and you store it for use later. So we were building these data loggers for research purposes, but obviously um, their purpose is, aside from that, all over the place uh, in terms of industry, saving money as a consumer in, in your energy usage. Um, but research is kind of, somehow I've landed in research even though I'm definitely not a researcher. So data loggers, uh, this, is, this is what I've been working on. So yeah, Momarine, uh, I've been working through the, in the in primarily in their ocean technology program, not just necessarily the club, but um, what we did this past semester was the Momarine Ocean Technology uh, Club, which is an education outreach program. Um, and aside from the, the club itself, the program is actually working with a lot of different data loggers. It turns out data loggers kind of persist throughout uh, research, especially marine research. So we constantly get people from different programs within Mo Marine coming to us saying, uh, we need a data logger to collect this information and it's gonna have to go out on a certain length of journey and collect these number of parameters and that's sort of our job to come up with that uh, assuming they have the funding. So these are some, this is uh, one of their favorite foundational pieces. It's called uh, a glider. This is made by Teldyne Webb. It's a ballast glider so has a payload in the center, a science payload, which is basically a handful of sensors. Depending on how much space you have, you can put whatever you want in there and it's gonna gather data. And it goes around the Gulf for usually deployments like two weeks. It costs about $1,000 a day to be out there uh, collecting data and sending it over like an Iridium satellite um, network. But it's also really expensive. So it's not accessible at all because it's $130,000 in itself plus $1,000 a day plus the boat to retrieve and uh, deploy. So one thing that they've been doing aside from that, because this is a, uh, they do plants regularly, but they also have an in-house um, device called the OPD. This particular one is the BB4. So I was working on this uh, two semesters ago, which is basically, we're taking in uh, salt water and we're saying, uh, okay, we're gonna do a measurement on what we, the actual, um, like the floating particulates in the water get a, a wave of that, what that, um, that uh, visual looks like, and then compare it against other known bacteria. We're using this one primarily to do uh, analysis on red tide. So this is what they have deployed locally throughout the Gulf and uh, more to docks. There's actually one that fits in the glider as in the science um, payload. But it's also really expensive, and it's not open source. This particular one, I think, is about $50,000 a piece. Uh, all proprietary, they're making new versions constantly, uh, but they're still expensive. It's kind of cool though, they, they have a couple in Antarctica, they work with Rutgers. Um, this is another, just another version of the data logger. So we took this and we said, okay, there's research happening all over the place, uh, especially at Moat. So there's a guy doing snook research uh, in Philippi Creek, and all he wanted basically, he's got an array of um, so, so he's tagged a bunch of snook that he's, he's grown in the lab, and they have little capsules in, injected or ingested into the fish, and then there's an array of sensors that in Philippi Creek and different bottleneck areas where if the, if the fish will swim over that array, it pings out, uh, his data logger, sends the location, the time, and what other, whatever other information he has um, as just an idea of where are these fish congregating why and when are they moving? But uh, so what we did is we partnered with him for the club, and this is 
the original version of what I've built over the course of this semester. It's huge. Uh, it's kind of hard to see because it's sideways, but this is a, about a foot by eight inch enclosure. It's got a giant battery running off of a huge solar panel array that's probably uh, three feet by three feet in the back of someone's yard who was nice enough to let us use their yard. Uh, and it's collecting temperature data whenever that fish is pinging over the array. So we wanted to go through and make something that's open source, easily available parts, and uh, a good way to learn, basically. So this is uh, the diagram of exactly what went into that. And I, I kind of came onto the project a little bit late, so I didn't have much of a say in the initial design. But I saw things I didn't like immediately. Uh, so this, the thing that, things that I don't like, there are just way too many parts. Uh, they all need to communicate, so it adds a lot of complexity. There are just too many moving things going on in terms of protocols and communication between all of them, uh, and it's expensive. So this is sort of the, the temperature and collection probe that's going to be sent underwater. It has an enclosure in itself. It's a dangerous place when you're going underwater um, with electronics. And then over here, we're talking about this is the brains. It's got a connection to the internet over a MiFi hotspot. Uh, and then SD card so that it can store that data if it doesn't have a connection, uh, etc. So this is a timed interval data logger that we built with the high schoolers. But like I said, too complex, too expensive. And I figured there are better ways to do it, especially when we want to kind of make a mass production of these things and get them all over the bay. So that's kind of what I decided to do on my own time, which is the version two of that sensor. Uh, this is the version two which is pretty small. Um, it's only three parts in necessity, but it's extensible in the sense that you can add as many as you want. I mean, it has extensible porting, and, and it's battery powered, so it's fully mobile, which is nice. Uh, you, want, you can pass around if you want. So, what did I do to make this one in particular? The first step was the enclosure. So the enclosure is fully acrylic. It's one fourth inch acrylic, uh, cast, different colors, just to make it fun, I guess. Uh, it's cut with a CO2 laser. So this is sort of the process it would go to. It magnifies a, a, a laser basically hot enough and strong enough to beam directly through the acrylic. I designed a 2D structure. It's basically just a box. So I have a, a file with all the faces, cuts them out, and then you weld them together. And then on that microprocessor that's, that's actually pro, uh, running the whole thing, I'm just going through a series of steps. It's actually very procedural, so it's running on a timed uh, an interval of time. I'm using 10 minutes for the most case. Uh, one, just because not a lot changes over 10 minutes when we're talking about temperature in the bay. Uh, so we found that 10 minutes is, a, is usually a good enough amount of time to take uh, the difference. And it keeps the power consumption actually really low. So basically here, it's always connected to the internet, so what I said is, in I know that the microprocessor processor can keep a pretty good idea of time on itself, just in terms of running, but it might be off by seven seconds every day or so. So every once in a while, I'm just gonna make a call out to a time server that exists, and then construct that time internally so that I have a good idea of it. That's what this is doing. It's basically saying, I can get the date and the time just by updating based on the NTP server. It's networked, so uh, I wanted it to be able to communicate with either a front end service or a server. Uh, I'm, I'm not really partial to either, but uh, it should be. It would be really nice if I could do both. Uh, so basically, that's what this is. The this microprocessor I'm using ha is a ESP8266. Uh, it's a Huzzah chip, and basically that means that for three dollars you can connect to Wi-Fi uh, and then send data, which is pretty pretty simple and pretty easy. Uh, that's basically what we're doing here. I'm constructing some measurement and then sending it over after I've already written it to the disk on board so then I have a local, local idea if I can't connect uh, to the internet. And then it goes into a deep sleep. So it completely shuts itself off except for one pin so that after a certain amount of time, it'll just kick itself and reboot so that it's not using power in between cycles. So then yeah, so then I have all this data and uh, I obviously want to consume it. Why would I collect it unless I wanted to consume the data in some way? So I have a textual format of just JSON that's going to exi exist uh, locally and in a server if I decide to use that. So 
this is going to be really nice if you're talking about research, like if you're trying to extrapolate something and then go further and uh, do what every researcher do. Uh, that's my, where I hand off. Then I have uh, an Electron JS app, so it's built. It's basically like a web application, like Tom was talking about. It's just taking the runtime of Chrome, so the runtime of the browser, and bringing it natively, so you have access to both the the SDK or like the development uh, tools of the OS itself, but also all the web technologies. It's pretty nice, cross-platform by default, uh, and it's easily packageable. And then I, after I got to there, I was like. What else can I, how else would I want to consume this data? So I, I figured, I'm sitting here in my room and I see my Amazon Alexa, Amazon Echo in the corner. I'm like, what if I could just ask for whatever I'm measuring? Uh, so that was the next thing that I'm both currently working on just for fun, but also implemented a simple version. So this is basically the app, the Electron app. So it's a Chrome window. Normally it sits up in the menu bar because I don't need to see it constantly, but I'm getting notifications because it's, it's existing as a server itself. Uh, so if it's local, I'm just sending a message directly from my data logger to my computer. Uh, under under this this uh, graph window, I, ha I have the, the map just so I can have an idea. If I have multiple of these deployed out wherever, they're going to have GPS data so that I can get an idea of where it exists, click on that one, and I have local data for that location. So this is simple, but it gives me a pretty good idea. I can go through as, all, as much data as I want. I have like... Uh, a simple filtering just for the number of actual um, points I'm looking for. And then, yeah, so this is this is how interesting to me because that's all you really need to, to interface with an Amazon device is that one function. So I have some database I'm, and I give it an intent. So the intent being uh, in the Amazon console I'm saying, my yes intent is if they sit, answer a question with some word that means yes, yes, sure, okay, whatever. Uh, all of those can be translated to this yes intent, which is gonna go through some simple flat file database, look for the parameter that I've already requested, and send it back, and then it's gonna tell me uh, what I requested. So it's simple, uh, interesting in the sense that they expose so much functionality without you having to do much at all. And then the yeah, extension. So I talked about this with uh, I talk about this a lot, actually, with a lot of different people. Um, wireless communication is really hard, uh, especially when you're talking about underwater. It's expensive if you're going to do it in the simplest way, uh, which is like some, some method of, of sound, really. So sound tra can transfer pretty well underwater, but fish are pretty noisy, too. So you have to worry about that a little bit. Um, so wireless communication is something I'm definitely interested in, but it's not something that I've really found a good, cheap way of doing that, considering that I think that device altogether was probably going to cost like 40 bucks. Um, it was like a sonar modem in itself is going to run hundreds, so even in the cheapest uh, version, it's not going to be great. And then, yeah, extendable porting. So I have a handful of JSD ports that I'm going to be adding to the actual board itself. That way, the sensor that you're actually trying to measure with doesn't matter at all. Um, it's just a four pin connection to communicate with a sensor like that. So you should be able to measure anything you want. And then, yeah, so waterproofing, like I said, that's hard. Um, one thing that I found that's pretty cool is that it's not hard to create a vacuum. So if you have some uh, one way entry to the actual enclosure, you can just suck out all the air. Um, that's sort of the route I'm thinking about going. I think we use syringes, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, that's where those are things I'm thinking about down the line. Yeah, and then questions if you have any. Sure, yeah. So why does it cost so much to just run the What? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, one one of the main issues is in um, well, so that's kind of extrapolated over a long period of time. So it's like how much money did you spend per day if you're talking about a 12 day deployment? So to run it for a deployment is really the cost, and then they just split it up into days. Um, the main thing that goes into that is satellite communication is expensive, uh, and you need a constant communication so that you can uh, tell it to do things, basically. You can kind of steer it uh, in a basic way, but more importantly, it's going to tell you where it is. Um, then you have things like loss, I think, get factored into that. Like I've heard about people losing $130 gliders. Like they had one off the back of a ship in Antarctica, that uh, got yanked without having its power connected and sunk to the bottom and it was gone forever. <laughs> and that was an intern, so it kind of sucks. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's all the 
procedural kind of um, logistic stuff, I think that really goes into it. Yep? What's the, uh, it looks almost like a battery pack on the back of the thing. Yeah, it is. It's a, this is a LiPo battery, so it's a rechargeable battery. Um, it's what's keeping it powered for the most part. It lasts pretty long because it shuts itself off entirely. The, the LEDs are probably what take the most power for the police, but they give me some uh, notification as to what's going on. So a red blink is saying, I'm either looking for a wireless connection, I haven't read a file like I should, uh, or there's some, some error, and then there's a blinking sequence that says, like, I'm, I'm reading uh, five measurements and averaging them right now. If I got rid of that, it would, it would probably last months. Um, I've heard people running them underwater for years, um, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. So you talked about wireless communication in an underwater environment. Yeah. Um, have you tried to communicate with sonar? I have not. <laughs> I don't, I don't have the, the resources at the moment. Uh, I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, it is really what, yeah, I haven't. But, it, okay. yeah, it's, a, it's interesting. Like, there's another project going on right now um, at Moat, which is they want to do uh, a hydrophone, basically. So they're people that are trying to kind of determine what fish are in different spawning aggregations based on the sounds that they hear. So if you put a sound, like a, a hydrophone underwater, it's loud constantly, and it doesn't seem that way because once you break the barrier of the water, it's quiet. Um, you can use, it, I mean, obviously you can use fre frequencies that you won't hear normally, um, but it's, it's tough. There's a lot of noise, so distance gets iffy and expense gets iffy. Any other questions? I have, I have a few questions. Sure. Um, excellent project, by the way. Um, the, uh, some of the problems you're facing, I, I want to make a suggestion. Yeah. There, there, there are other technologies that you could leverage. For example, in fact, this has a double, a double direction, a bidirectional capability. There's a very popular set of technology that we're using now called CubeSat. Are you familiar with CubeSat? No. Okay. You should look into CubeSat for this reason. Mm -hmm. These are small miniature satellites about that big that we're sending up into space. And they're very, very competitive. The funding from the DOD is huge, yeah. huge, huge. There are organizations all around the country and the world wanting to play along. It's a very competitive, but very active and dynamic infrastructure. Yeah. Now, I think a lot of problems, or some of the problems you're having, could be solved the same way we're solving them with the CubeSats, number one. Likewise, you might be doing some, some things that could be compatible and useful with the CubeSat community. So I encourage you to look into that to see what you can glean from that, number yeah. one. Number two, um, from what I'm seeing here, this issue of communicating, we talked a little bit about this. Yeah. Um, there's, other, there's other kinds of technologies that I don't know are, if they're even compatible with this. For example, we worked many years ago with the University of Texas, um, and I encourage you, strongly encourage you to reach out to other academic institutions with this. Mm -hmm. You can get their attention with this really easily, I guarantee it. The University of Texas is one of them. They brought their technology to Tampa Bay many years ago on a contract that was being funded on under the uh, Navy. And um, what they would do is pretty cool. They had a technology where they would, um, they have a technology, it's an underwater, underwater hydrophone configuration uh, design, where they could listen to, they, what they were after was, was trying to shut down the drug traffic from South America. So there's three, there's three avenues of this. And as I'm telling you this, I'm, I'm thinking about perhaps this as a role yeah, yeah. in one of these areas. So there's the brown water, I'm sorry, there's, there's, the, there's the green, what they call the green water, the brown water, and the blue water. Those are the three designated spaces that the, that the marine uh, organizations like Southcom are going after. Yeah. The green water uh, is actually not water, it's, the, it's what they cultivate the crops. The cocaine and all the marijuana and stuff like that. So they go after them there. The brown water are the tributaries and what they call riverine areas of South America. Mm -hmm. They use these riverine areas like we use interstates here. The blue water is, of course, the open water, where they get the, the drug, high-speed drug boats going out to submarines to, to, move, the, to move the drugs and yeah. so forth. What, what um, University of Texas does, and as much as I can tell you, is um, they have a hydrophone uh, network where they, um, they, uh, they, these are tethered to the bottom of the ocean. So they, 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 listen into, they listen into propellers, and they, can, yeah. they actually have onboard technology where they can profile the signature of the, of the boat. They can tell you what kind of boat is using that engine and that sound. Then what they want to do is that when they want to exfiltrate the information, when they want to broadcast it, they release the, it, it, the, the, the um, module, the pod, is, is tethered and rises to the surface. 
transmits it over satellite, and then goes back underwater. Uh, so it's very, very clandestine. How? It's a, it's a, well, the, the, the module on the ocean floor reels it out. Oh, cool. It's, it's, it's buoyant, yeah. so it wants to float, but all they gotta do is just, is reel it. Now I'm not suggesting, that's a lot, that's very power consuming and somewhat higher technology. However, there's some things to think about in terms of hybrid technologies, in terms of what you're trying to do. Yeah. Now, hydrophones and some um, underwater um, hydrophone technology is not low power. It's off, I'm, I've been often affiliated with high power applications, yeah. so you gotta be careful with that. It's great, it works wonderful. Um, and there are other ways to, you know, DSP algorithms where you can, you know, you can filter out a lot of the noise and stuff like that. We've been doing that for decades. So there may be some clever ways. I guess what I'm trying to say is whatever you come up with for this, you may find that it's applicable to other technologies and other, other venues like in space that you might not have thought about. And likewise, things you're doing may be directly apl applicable to what you're doing yeah. as well. Um, I, I have a question. The processor, you said it was ESP8266? ESP8266 is, is the, the Wi-Fi chip that exists on the board. The processor is, a, I think, at mega. Okay, okay, that's what I was getting at. So, and, I, and that answered the next three or four questions, actually, which is, um, which is a basically a portable app. So, um, I'm curious, um, after looking at watching Tom's presentation, why didn't you use something like a Raspberry Pi or Arduino? Which is a pre-existing configured platform. Yeah. So I mean, it is it is our the app mega. Okay. In fact, the exact process. Okay. 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 In fact, I thought that's what they use on the on the yeah. pies. Well, the, I wasn't sure if it was the ARM or the app mega. The ARM's on the pie. The pie, The reason I don't want I did well pie consumes more power. Okay. Uh, it's larger. Okay. And okay. it has a lot of stuff I I don't personally need. Yeah. We, we use the app mega actually in, in remote yeah. unattended what we call remote yeah. rugs uh, remote unattended ground sensors. Exactly. Where we had to shut the thing down, go to sleep, yeah. and wait for something so to that's, happen. That's that's the main thing. Oh, um, that was the other thing I want to mention. So there's a lot of military technology. Well, not a military advocate by <laughs> any means. In this sense, I'm just saying that there's a lot of neat technology that you might want to consider using. Yeah. When I talk about remote, unattended ground sensors and air deployed, self configuring, self healing systems, that's exactly what you got. So what I'm saying is use what's out there, build it into it, and then turn it back around to see who might be interested in gaining access to what you're doing. Th this is a big, big, big area what you're doing. Uh, data logging and, and remote logging, multi, what we call multimodal sensors and things like this. I'll, I'll show you next week in my presentation, there are multiple agencies that would be very interested. You might even be able to get funded to get to develop this technology into some of the applications that are coming out of solicitations yeah. from the various agencies up in, up in Washington. Very cool. Fantastic. <laughs> Any other questions? If I could just like say something real quick, I don't I don't blame you for not using a Pi because first of all, this is this battery right here is a twenty two milliamp hour uh, battery, twenty two hundred. Twenty two hundred, wow! And it goes through like get out of here. That no, it, this thing this thing takes a lot of power. Yeah, it really. There's no there's no low power modes or power down modes on that. Not that I can find. I tried configuring it. Oh my goodness! You can, you can you have power in pins you're not using. Sure, sure. I mean, I used a couple Pi's for my thesis because my thesis was already sure. consuming a ton of power, but. Yeah. Uh, just running a lot of services I don't personally need. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I didn't realize it was. Uh, I always thought you could power those things and put them in low power mode for a signal. I know you can with the MA because that's what it's designed to do. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Okay. Um, you all want to take a break or shall we keep going? Uh, all right. Well, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down the list of, of the um, sign up list. Um, oh, you guys want to take a break? We can take a break. Why don't we take a break and come back and we'll pick up where we, where we left off. How's that? Okay?